The New York Mets lineup erupted for nine runs against the Giants on Thursday. On the show today, we'll be discussing the offensive outbreak. Pete Alonso, a big part of it. I also want to get into why the Mets might be in a better position this year because they did not extend Alonso because this man is chasing a big old bag and he might carry the Mets very, very far because of it. We're going to get to all of that on today's edition of Locked On Mets. You are Locked On Mets, your daily New York Mets podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello to all you amazing Mets fans. You're watching Locked On Mets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, Ryan Finkelstein. If you want to find any of my work, follow me on Twitter at Finkelstein Ryan. You can also find some of my writing at JustBaseball.com, where I work as the managing editor, and where I wrote an article today about Pete Alonzo and the fact that he is playing like a man that is about to get a big, big contract. We're going to get to that later in the show, though. Before we do... Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Last-minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Now, the Mets went into San Francisco, and they just put a beating on that pitching staff. This is what they got to do the entire series. I think the Giants can score runs, particularly on a a Mets team that's, I guess, going to roll Joey Lucchese, uh, David Peterson, Tyler McGill to close out this series. So there's going to be some opportunity for the Giants to score runs. The Mets got to beat up on their pitching staff. And we saw tonight they can do just that. So before we really get into the nuts and bolts of this game, there's a couple of takeaways I had just based on the starting lineup. For one, no Brett Beatty, no Francisco Alvarez. This might be a theme that frustrates Mets fans. I will say I did note on yesterday's show that this was the matchup to get Eduardo Escobar in the game against a lefty he could handle. And he had a two-run homer. So I'm not mad at that one. Now, the thing that does frustrate me is you had an opportunity to get Francisco Alvarez in the game against lefty. Louis Guillaume ended up playing well, okay? He went one for four, made some slick plays in the field. He scored a run, drew a walk. Fine. And, of course, I'm not a guy that's knocking when Guillaume is in the lineup. But it is interesting that they start him against a lefty here. And that tells me one thing. It has nothing to do with Alvarez or Beatty. It tells me that this Mets team, they are not comfortable with anyone other than Jeff McNeil playing right field other than Starling Marte. That they would prefer, at least, to keep Cannon in left, keep Tommy Pham in left. Because they could have gone into the game today, started Jeff McNeil at second base, put Tommy Pham in right instead of DHing him, and they could have DHed Alvarez. Or they could have, if they wanted to, got Escobar in the lineup as a DH and DH Beatty. Instead, they go with this lineup where they play Guillaume against the lefty. I think that has something to do with the defensive alignment there. Starling Marte dealing with that neck injury still day-to-day, but out in this one. And that puts you in a weird spot because now you're down a couple of men because Max Scherzer is suspended for 10 games and he will uphold that suspension. One thing I was wrong about, well, a couple things. Yesterday, a lot of you pointed out that I had the Mets record wrong on this road trip. I apologize. I forgot they swept the athletics. What can I say? I own it when I make mistakes. I did. And guess what? <laughs> now with this win, looks like they're heading towards an incredible road trip. Let's see if I can do the math this time. They were 5-1. and one. That makes them 6-1 and one with three to play. We'll see how far they can take things. Um, in San Francisco, but without Scherzer, the Mets have to play a man down. Uh, but I also was wrong in saying that you know the suspension could keep him out for that Brave series by serving it right now. They'll have him back for the Brave series, and that is why he's accepting this without any appeal. Also, he thought that it might be in front of an individual arbiter. It wouldn't. It would have been in front of MLB officials, and they would have up- upheld it. So that's the only decision to make now. This Mets team just had a great offensive game. I want to focus on that before we get into Kodai Senga's struggles a little bit, and then we'll you know, spend a lot of the show on Pete Alonso. But Brandon Nimmo is up to 368 with the batting average. He was 3 for 5 in this game. He continues to hit. Uh, you know, Lindor, not his best game, but still scored two runs. Pete Alonso, though, 
Two for four, two runs scored, four RBIs. He gets the scoring going for the Mets in the fifth inning. Francisco Lindor got hit by a pitch. Or actually, it was the fourth inning. Excuse me. Top of the fourth. Lindor gets hit by a pitch. Pete Alonso homers. Then Jeff McNeil gets hit by a pitch. Eduardo Escobar hits his two-run homer. So all of a sudden, the Mets are up 4 nothing. Guillaume draws a walk. He scores on a double from Brandon Nimmo. Kodai Senga spotted five runs after putting up a bunch of zeros to start the game. But Senga never looked great in this one, and he ends up giving up a four spot uh, in the bottom of the fifth where it was a couple of home runs, it was a few walks, a base hit scored one, a wild pitch scored another. Senga ultimately in this game just didn't have his best stuff, was a little bit wild, um, You know, didn't quite even have the same strikeout stuff we're accustomed to with him. Uh, what do you get? Four? Yeah, four strikeouts, four walks, five hits, four earned, the two home runs. ERA in the season now at 4.29. That's your best starting pitcher right now. So the Mets need this lineup to carry them because their pitching's not going to. And luckily in this one, you just got it up and down the lineup. Jeff McNeil hit his first home run of the season. This is right after Sanga gives up four. It's always important to respond when another team scores. McNeil did that with the solo shot. That was big. And then the seventh thing, the Mets run together a rally and. Once again, who was it? Pete Alonso driving in runs. That's the thing that is so impressive about him is it's the home runs, but it's also just the the full approach that he takes now as a hitter. And you you get into that spot, you know, seventh inning. You have uh, the rare double-double that didn't score a run. Marcana doubled. That one was, you know, deep into the outfield a little bit or or in the corner. Uh, Lindor, though, hits a bloop. Right? And they don't catch it. He gets to second base, but Canna has to hold on so he doesn't score. So the rare double-double that did not uh, result in a run. Pete Alonso comes up with two runners in scoring position. What does he do? Gets behind in the count, so he shortens up. Finds a hole. Shoots a single through it. Gives the Mets a couple more runs. Lindor scoring from second on that play. Really impressive base running to test the arm out there. And there you go. The Mets end up with a comfortable lead after that one. Uh, Jeff McNeil got another RBI hit as well. He got a base hit that scored Alonzo. And the Mets end up with those nine runs, which ultimately uh, was the difference in the ball game, right? Uh, you look at the bullpen today, just again, solid work from that unit. Brooks Raley with an inning, John Curtis with an inning, Drew Smith with an inning, and then Jeff Brigham gets an inning. So there you go. Uh, this Mets team finds a way to beat the Giants, and they stay away from David Robertson and Adam Adovino, keeping those high-leverage arms fresh to potentially go on Friday. But Pete Alonzo is the man that I want to spend a lot of this show talking about because the start he has been on this season has been something to behold. And I really believe, I know it's crazy to say this, that the Mets maybe made the right move and not extending him. I'm going to tell you why. I know it's a little bit of a kooky argument, but I wrote all about it today, and I really feel strongly about this one. So we're going to get to all that in just a minute. Before we do, though, today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. If you've ever been struggling to find tickets to the game, Game Time is where you want to go, particularly for last-minute tickets. It is a fast and easy way to buy all of your tickets for sports, music, comedy, and theater near you with killer deals on last-minute tickets with their best price guarantee so you can stop stressing over tickets and start getting hyped for all the fun you're going to have. That game time guarantee means you're always going to get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section or row for less, game time will credit you 110% of the difference. It's the fastest growing ticketing app for a reason. Get images of your seat before you buy so you know what to expect when you arrive. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Two taps, you're all set. Tickets are sent directly to your phone so you never have to dig through your email. Download the Game Time app, create an account, use the code LOCKEDONMLB to get $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code LOCKEDONMLB for $20 off. Download the Game Time app today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Now, before we discuss my article on Pete Alonso, I do want to mention a stat on Kodai Senga. He threw 25 ghost forks in this game and... Only got swings on 11 of them. Now, only four whiffs on those 11 swings. Here's one thing I'll say about Senga. If he does not have the ghost fork going, 
This is a pitch that batters can spit on, and he can throw it for a ball a lot. He doesn't throw it for a call strike very often. A lot of times it's swing strikes as guys just swing through it. If he's not getting the swing and miss, if he's not getting the swings and, and batters are identifying it and just not pulling the trigger, it's going to make his night a lot longer. I think that's what we saw in this one. We still see that he can get out other ways. I mean, we saw some strikeouts with the fastball tonight, so I, I think he'll figure it out. But look, as I alluded to before the season, early it's going to be all Sanga because you know the league hasn't seen him before. But data travels faster than ever, and maybe this the last couple starts is you know teams adjusting back to him. Now it's time for Sanga to counter. I, I'm not overall concerned about what we've seen. Lately, I still think he's a great option for the Mets, who will have a a lot better starts in the future. But let's get to the main ticket item of the show today, which, of course, is Pete Alonzo. wrote an article for JustBaseball.com, said Pete Alonzo is playing like a man who's about to get a big contract. And I actually tweeted about this as well, but um, I I know on yesterday's show, I I paid a little tribute to Joe D of Mets Prize, the founder who just passed away, and I just want to say, as far as the podcast I'm doing and the article I just wrote, you know, after, you know, that just happened and someone I knew, you know, passed away that was a really formative figure in the beginning of my career, to be able to have been assigned from another editor, actually. Jack McMillan told me, we should write about Pete. I'm like, I'm in. To be writing about a Mets player I'm passionate about, I had so much fun writing this article. And really, as much as podcasting has been my thing, and you know, at times it's it's kind of where I lean towards. Writing about the New York Mets is still my strong suit, so I really do encourage you guys to read this article. I'll put it in the description of the episode um, because I, I put some gems in there that you'll find, and I'll actually spoil one here. It's near the conclusion of my article, but to me, it really rings true, and it was kind of the overall thesis of where I was trying to get to with this article. And I said, I also tweeted this out too, when I did share the, the article, I uh, said, while not likely not by design, Steve Cohen may have picked the perfect guy to wait on giving a long-term extension. Yes. Alonzo may cost him a lot of money down the line, but a hungry polar bear is the most ferocious. No Pete Alonzo not getting a contract, as crazy as it sounds, might have been the best thing for this New York Mets team. We just saw Aaron Judge, in a contract year, deliver the 63 home runs. Was 63? No, 62 home runs. 61 was the record. 62 home runs um, to, to pass Maris, to lead the Yankees to a division. He was unbelievable. And in my article, I compare the two, not to say Pete Alonzo is going to put up an 11.5 F4 season. It's not that kind of player. But what we are going to see from Pete Alonso is a guy that could chase down that type of a home run record. That could hit 64 home runs this year if he wanted to. 65. Could push the envelope. I don't know if he's catching bonds, but he could be you know, right up on that list. And that is the, the power potential that Alonso has. Only a few guys in baseball can you really say are capable of doing what Aaron Judge just did. It's Judge, it's Trout, it's Otani, it's maybe Vlad Guerrero Jr., potentially guys like Tatis, but really, I put Alonzo behind only maybe Trout and Otani, just because those guys are the GOATs, right? Those are the the, the best players in baseball. But Pete Alonzo is a home run hitter. I, I do remind you, since 2019, he leads all of baseball in home runs. He leads all of baseball and runs batted in. This is a guy who has proven time and again that he's a consistent run producer. And I do have a lot of theories about why he's going to have his best season. But what's interesting to me is the circumstances that led him into this position. Because you look at the 2022 Mets, right? All these guys had career years up and down. Lindor, not quite a career year, but you know, second best probably. Alonzo, right up there with his 2019 season. Um, probably better as far as just being an overall hitter. Brandon Immel, by far career year. Jeff McNeil, by far career year. Edwin Diaz, a career year. All those three guys I mentioned at the end, Diaz, Nimmo, McNeil, they all got contracts. Lindor got one the year prior. So everyone's locked up. You have a core that is building. You have top prospects coming up and Beatty and Alvarez that are the future, not to mention Guys like Mark Vientos and Ronnie Mauricio that don't have positions, not to say Mauricio is going to play first base, but Vientos could. 
Pete Alonso is not guaranteed anything as far as being a long-term fixture on this Mets team. And it's because, as I've alluded to on previous shows, he was too damn good early in his career. The Mets wasted time trying to extend him. Now, you are almost better letting him play out because, you know, if you had to sign him now, the number would be so astronomical anyway. But he's making that number bigger and bigger with each passing day. I know some fans are like, oh my God, extend him. It's going to get out of control. Maybe that's what you want. Maybe that's what this team needs. Maybe they need a, as I mentioned in the article, a hungry and ferocious polar bear. A guy that is playing for something along with the team's success. As much as we want to be team first, rah, rah, rah. There is something about putting money in the bank. There is something about providing for your family and your future generations of your family. And Alonzo has that right now. And you're seeing that hunger in the way he's playing the game. You see it in the way he attacked the offseason and showed up in the best shape of his career. And he is so locked in right now. He's at nine home runs already to lead all of Major League Baseball. And he's not slowing down. I want to go through where I think this is leading because it's leading towards the Mets getting a season to remember. Before we get into that, though, I'm having a season to remember on my new favorite game, Ultimate Pro Baseball GM, where I get to run the New York Mets as if I'm Billy Epler. I get to manage every strategic aspect of my team, play through a season. I'm trying to lead my team to glory. I'm responsible for Hiring the right coaches and staff, managing team finances, scouting and drafting players, managing difficult personalities, navigating my franchise through free agency and all the ups and downs of a season. All of this in a challenging and realistic game world. Ultimate Baseball GM is completely free and playable offline. That's why I love it so much. Because when I'm on the go, pull out my phone, I can make a little trade. I can have some fun once downloaded. You don't need Wi-Fi to play. It's all there for you in app play. Locked on Mets listeners are going to get 100% free boost to their franchise when using the promo code locked on in the game store, so make sure to check it out. Then on the game, just visit probaseballgm.com, scan the code, or look it up on the app stores. That's probaseballgm.com. Check out Ultimate Baseball GM. Start your dynasty today. So Pete Alonzo is making himself a lot of money right now. And you know, he's two years away from free agency. He's making $14.5 million in the second year of arbitration next year. If everything breaks the way it's starting to, you're looking at probably twenty million dollars in arbitration, and with that, you know that's thirty-five over the final two years. The Mets would have to start the contract so high that I don't know if they can extend them, and I don't think they should. I don't. Not to say they shouldn't extend them after this season, but get a guy who, who's got that hunger for a big, big contract and you put it into the mix, that's what the Mets need right now. And this guy is just on a different planet. Nine home runs. And it's honestly, as great as the home runs are to me, it's the fact that his approach is just fantastic. For someone that's watched every single bat of his career at this point, the biggest change in Pete Alonso from 2019, Polar Bear 1.0 to now Polar Bear you know, 5.0, is that then... He was chasing that rookie home run record. Every single at bat, he was swinging to hit the ball 450. Sometimes there was a little bit of an approach, but nowhere near what we see now. Now, this is a guy that takes what comes to him. You know, if they're going to walk him, he's going to take his walks. Right now, this was going into the game today. Career best walk rate of 12.5%. You look at the batting average. Got it over 270 the last two years. Maybe this is just me still reminiscing about when I was a little boy watching Mets games with my dad uh, where he told me, look, the great hitters hit 300. The really good ones hit 270. And then over the years, it's like, well, not many guys are hitting 300 anymore, so the great hitters are hitting 270. Pete Alonzo, to be over 270 last year, to be doing it again right now, it shows you a complete hitter, a guy that will take his walk so he's not you know, in a situation where he's striking out chasing bad pitches. He gets an RBI situation like the other day against the Dodgers. You had a runner on second base, one out. Um, was second? Yeah, no, no, actually, runner on third base. Excuse me, one out. 
uh, 7-6 ball game, if I'm not mistaken. But it was a tight game late. Pete Alonso could have tried swinging for the fences. Instead, he looked at an infield alignment that only had two guys on the left side because, of course, the elimination of the shift. But last year, you might have seen three guys on the left side. So the shortstop and the third baseman and a nice healthy gap in between them. He punches it right through that hole. 107.4 miles per hour off the bat. Just shortens up, rips a line drive, gets it through. Run comes around to score. Easy, clean RBI for Pete Alonso. Today, we saw the same thing. Falls behind the count, shortens up, finds a hole, hits it through it, scores two runs. That is what Pete Alonso does that is so impressive. He is great with runners in scoring position, with runners on base in general, and he's just not going to let you completely pitch around him and, and and get himself out in those spots. If you try to pitch around him, you know, he's going to take his walks, and if you try to attack him, He's not just going to be looking at what could be a well-executed pitch where it's you know a fastball on the outside corner that you know he doesn't want to try to go with to hit out, and he's not going to try to pull it and yank it out of the ballpark. So what does he do? He yanks that ground ball that gets through the gap you know, on the left side of the infield. Little things like that have been really impressive, and everything is lined up for him to have a monster campaign. And again, if it costs the Mets in the long run, it does. But right now you have a guy that is hungry as as anyone. He is on pace for a double-digit home run month to start the season. Still got nine days left in April. And I'll tell you what, the last two years, he never got to a home run streak this early. Uh, You look at last year, uh, I believe it was four home runs uh, in, in April. Yes, last year was April. And then... Sorry, two two years ago, 2021, that was the crazy one because that's when it only hit 37. He had seven home runs by June. That was it. June started seven homers. He's at nine right now. Last time he had nine home runs in the first month of the season, his rookie year. He followed it up with nine more, and by the All-Star break, he had 30. Pete Alonso could have 35 this year, and I wouldn't be shocked by the break. I really wouldn't. He could have that type of a season. Also, just one note at the end before we close. The defense has been incredible at first base. He is looking so athletic. He is making all the plays. He's making the tough plays. He is just a steady force defensively. And I don't know how the metrics are going to favor him throughout the year, but I really think they're going to be better. And, and that's going to help him too because at times, you know, if you're looking at like an MVP race, for example, at, at times the defense will knock a couple of wins off. If he just gets the league average defensively and then he collects his, you know, six and a half wins or seven wins of offensive value, that's a guy that's going to compete for MVPs on top of home run records, RBI titles. Pete Alonzo is carrying this Mets lineup right now, and you absolutely love to see it. Uh, we'll see if he can keep it going over the weekend. I think this is uh, some good matchups for him, a, a team that's going to. Give him some barbecue chicken out of that bullpen every every once in a while. And a guy in Alonzo right now that's just taking advantage of every single mistake that an opposing pitcher makes. Anyway, well, that's going to be all for today's edition of Locked on Mets this week on Locked on Mets. Yes, I made it to the end of the West Coast week. Oh, it's delightful. Uh, we always love that. Make sure you follow, you rate, you review wherever you get your podcast. Follow me on Twitter at Ficklestein Ryan. Follow the show at Locked on Mets. For all you everydayers, I will be back on Monday breaking down everything from this series in San Francisco against the Giants.